So good morning. Uh, today we're going to be uh, continuing our discussion, um, which has started with great brevity, uh, concerning the interaction between um, the use of wiring diagrams together with dynamical systems and uh, within the, the framework of uh, poly, this category of polynomial functors. Um, we had started uh, some discussion of this uh, last time, um, noting uh, some of the important roles that uh, the wiring diagrams play uh, in adding, adding to the many virtues that already recommend polynomial functors. Um, so uh, previously, yeah, I, had, I had noted, you know, putting aside wiring diagrams that, that these functors, uh, these p of y, where p is a polynomial, y is some here a set, and you're adding these together, um, that they support <clears throat> a degree of, uh, of elegance. Um, they're modular. Uh, we can sort of cobble together these specifications of larger systems out of smaller systems. Uh, there's they're transformable, um, and, and that occurs at many levels. Um, but fundamentally, we can symbolically transform and even visually transform these, um, th these types of, of, of systems. I, I shouldn't say visual yet. Uh, that's with the wiring diagrams, which I'll get to in a second. But uh, we can transform them. We can combine them. And uh, we'll be seeing more of that today. But um, where we, for example, tensor together things that are sums of modes. And, and we can do that by tensoring first and then summing or summing first and then tensoring uh, and get something that's provably the same. It, it turns out that in our next uh, video, um, uh, David Jazz Myers in a guest lecture here in day 4.5 of this course, um, will also show this demonstration of sort of how we can use these mechanisms to safely map between state spaces, for example, in ways that are provably consistent, where one is like a, a coarse graining of another. It's a characterization of the same dynamics, but with less, with fewer details um, being captured in the internal state and, and yet have a um, equivalence in terms of external behavior, in terms of of what you read out through a specific interface, for example. They're composable. Um, uh, we could have mapping between interfaces, substitution, uh, and they're supportive of, of analytic reasoning, as we'll hear from David Jazz Myers. Um, it may not be able to be within this course, but uh, it will be lecture 6.5 um, uh, in, in the second of his lectures, guest lectures where he talks about um, how you can represent uh, behavioral modes like equilibria or oscillations um, using certain patterns visually and um, certain systems as it were. And you can get this um, when you combine systems uh, analytically in some symbolic way, you can, you can, get out combinations of their uh, behaviors or behavioral modes via matrix arithmetic. Um, but when we take wiring diagrams, we're adding to that a level of sort of transparency and visual reasoning um, that's quite robust. Uh, we don't have to worry we're reasoning it, we're, we're reading it in the wrong way because if we read it in two different ways, it gives the same interpretation ultimately, something that's provably the same but it may be useful to see it in two different ways. Uh, so many of these characteristics will uh, come out more uh, today. And, um, you know, we've uh, we featured some of them in the small and, and we'll see, uh, see some examples that were featured uh, in those courses. So just as a, or in those, those lectures, just as a reminder, um, uh, dynamical systems could be represented as these 
lens morphisms. And again, I'm using this notation due to David Jazz Myers because uh, in his lecture day 4.5, the next video we'll be watching, um, there's a different type of morphism between polynomials, which is called a chart, and where it is two forward arrows that will be used to kind of coarse grain state spaces and 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 take um, uh, take a sort of a provably correct approximation to another one. Uh, but in general, we can represent dynamical systems with these lenses, and if P is a monomial. Um, uh, we have a, a dynamical system with just mode that can actually be represented with a wiring diagram. Now, it, it has some other features to it. Like if P, when I say a monomial, it's like A times Y to the B. Um, a is the output, B is the input. And um, if, if we do have that case, this is. Uh, something that corresponds rather, rather closely, actually, to um, to an, our notion of a lens. Uh, if we do have that, and maybe I'll I'll just uh, write that down here, so I don't need to require your imagination. Um, we have something like this. Hey, come on, stop, stop that, stop that. Okay. Um, then this is two maps, right? It's one going uh, from S to A, that's the readout. That's for a dynamical system. That's like saying, what's our output for our current state of the system represented by S? Uh, but then we also have this S cross, and apologies, I don't have my, my nice, uh, nice ways of writing this at the moment. Um, but uh, excuse me, S cross B, for every S, we have a mapping from B to S. And this has the flavor of a lens very much. Uh, a lens where this set, B, is fixed, um, as it is for traditional lenses. With a, with a mapping to a polynomial, we have a generalized lens. B, what set it is that is here, will depend on this state S. So it's a dependent lens. It's a lens whose whose mapping has this dependency. And it's one of the reasons why uh, Idris, for example, can be um, uh, effective in characterizing these because they characterize dependent types. Types uh, where the choice of the type or the, 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 the identity of that type depends on a piece of data. In this case, you know what state we're in will depend on what set it is we use here, what the input set is. Um, that would be if we had, instead of ay to the b, ay to the b plus you know cy to the d, blah, blah, blah. Um, then to figure out if we're, we have b or if we have d from that second term, we, we have to, um, uh, it depends on s, um, which, uh, you know, which one it, to which one it maps, essentially. Um, okay, so wiring diagrams have this nice feature of, of uh, direct correspondence with these maps between monomials. Um, you can capture a set of basically simple behaviors. And these behaviors basically relate subsystems to outer systems. Um, so they relate how the interfaces to these inner systems relate to the interface for the the interface for the outer system. Um, so here we have an inner system uh, that has the interface by to the AC. It has inputs A and C, or you could think of it as a pair of A and C. That's where they're multiplied together. Um, you got to specify both of them. And you have an output B. That's kind of the interface for this system and this subsystem. And then we have an interface for this subsystem, which takes a B as an input and outputs D and C. And tensoring them together, we're saying they're operating at parallel. And that is a, this lens morphism to, uh, to the interface for the entire thing, which takes an A and outputs a D. So really, you could think of the wiring diagram as saying, 
how do the interfaces to the subsystems get hitched up to interfaces to the system as a whole? Um, and that theme will will follow us um, uh, follow us through through our discussion here um, and applying to some of the the major examples. So these wired diagrams again have this direct correspondence with symbolic notation. You can use one with another, but wiring diagrams can be more specific in certain aspects, such as like swapping wires that have the same type. Um, and uh, they do compose via hierarchical substitution. We can kind of substitute something in a subsystem yet, a sub subsystem. Um, maybe it's a set of them and we can collapse down the hierarchy and um, have just this outer system with those two subsystems of this and maybe three subsystems of this um, uh, and have these intermediate ones disappear. Um, that's kind of nice. Um, so David Jazz Meyer's work. So I, I want to highlight this because it's of some importance, I think, to my interest in this material. It's David Jazz Meyer's work. Um, and I had pointed you to his book, um, has some really interesting um, generalizations. Beyond just using set, he does things, uh, for example, where we use monads, and monads can be used to capture effects um, in the context of these wiring diagrams or the context of these dynamical systems. I'm extraordinarily interested in that for reasons that Alex would probably immediately recognize. Um, but you know, it allows it allows one to do a lot more than computation on set. Really, you need a Cartesian or I think maybe Cartesian closed category. Um, uh, and you know, wiring diagrams aren't the only story. There are these so-called more exotic interaction protocols um, that uh, that might have, you know, switching between modes here. Uh, in a way that is not directly amenable to full illustration as a wiring diagram. And uh, as time allows, we'll, we'll see that today with uh, Turing machines, for example. Um, one thing I didn't really talk too much about was this issue of initial state. It is featured in the book, um, but I thought I would... Um, you know, make, make a, one mention of this to make it less mysterious. So our dyna dynamical system as a whole can be thought of as consisting of two maps. One map is the one we've been, of which we've been speaking here. Um, and that relates to its readout and its output, its evolution and, and, and output. But there's another map here, y to the uh, y of s, which I kind of mumbled is associated with its initialization, its initial state. And I wanted to unpack that a little bit because it, it, it probably seems uh, a wee bit mysterious. So if we think about this, um, we could rewrite this you know, without any change as one y to the one, um, uh, just emphasizing the outputs and inputs here, or the positions and the exponents that uh, there. And, you know, there's two maps here, uh, as indicated by these arrows. One forward map, um, which basically picks out a value of the S. And uh, I don't know why this says Y to the S, except uh, I wrote this uh, too late last night after Omicroning um, colleagues and so on. Um, that is uh, letting them know the latest uh, very concerning news. Um, so uh, here, I don't know what's going on. Um, one, one to the S is the mapping of positions, right? This, this, this um, is a map consisting of map of positions, V sub one, uh, or here R, um, well, no, I, I won't analogize it to R, but it's it's mapping on positions one to the S. So really, what this does is pick out a value of S. Right? It's it's this old trick, this old kind of chestnut that if you uh, only have a singleton from which to map, and you map it to S, um, really it just means coming down and saying, 
I mean, you know, it maps oh, to this, this particular S or that particular S. It picks a value from S and that's our initial state. And then this other map, the backwards map, the map on exponents contextualized by positions really is just a trivial map, trivial in the sense that there's no choice. Uh, it's one times S to the, oh man, to the one. It's, there's no choice involved. So the net effect is you're specifying an initial state. Um, and it's kind of nice to think of them, you know, in this, in this context. Uh, it is notable that if you have this relationship of this dynamical system, this state to an interface, you're also specifying an initial state of this interface um, with this mapping too. If you compose these two, you'll get a map to P. And it's picking an initial state for this interface, which is kind of nice. Um, so writing them in this way, rather than just saying, pick an initial state S, um, allows you to compose these things and, and you know, use the, the um, machinery um, that's, that's available here. Um, so um, as David notes in response to a question, wiring diagrams specify these simple maps of inputs and outputs of subsystems to inputs and outputs of the entire system. And they're simple because they, they just do a few things, um, but they do them well. They do them visually and transparently. They swap wires, they branch wires, and they project. Um, given an A and B, they can give you an A, for example, or they can give you separately a, a B. Those would be the projections. Um, now, um, uh, we can, we, we here have kind of morphisms, um, which can represent uh, uh, hierarchical uh, nesting, um, a mapping from the inner systems or the interface of the inner systems to the uh, to the outer outer systems, or inputs and outputs from enclosed systems to inputs and outputs for the entire system. Um, right, and I talked about uh, composition of, of morphisms with erasing the boundaries. So we tensor these things up um, to get a mapping for the whole which is just tensoring uh, these components. Uh, so if we have these as subsystems, uh, we, uh, they have these states, we can, um, or these, uh, these are the states, we can have a state for the entire system that's a tensor product. And it kind of makes sense because the, you know, the state of the entire system is just a tensor of the states of, of these systems. It's just a, well, let me be more specific. It's the product here. So if we have possibility, S possibilities here and T possibilities here, in general, we'll have S times T possibilities. We could be in any state of S and any state of T. So it's like a table of possibilities of S and T from the other dimension. Um, okay. Um, and of course, each of these internal subsystems um, has its has an interface and a state. So the interface is not the same as the state. Here we're tensoring up um, uh, the states. Here we're tensoring up the interfaces associated with it. Um, the result is a complete state for the system and a lens map to the interface for, for the entire system as well. This is the interface for the entire system. Um, Okay, um, right. And, you know, I had mentioned this subtlety about the monoidal unit. And if you have no inputs, you still get Y to the one. This would be relevant for a Turing machine case. And you could kind of think of that as, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of analogy which David and, and, and Nelson give is that indicates kind of a clock, right? Saying next, next, next. Um, as one possible input. But it's a reflection of the fact that the kind of monoidal unit for product, these things are, 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 are products here um, associated with well, um, each of these sides or each of these sides for the whole. And the monoidal unit for product is the 
singleton set one. Um, it's not empty set, um, but that's why it's a watt of the one. Um, okay, so I talked about a wiring diagram or more specific sometimes than just kind of the types associated with notation. Um, of course, if we didn't label these AA, but we labeled them AB, you know, uh, AB and BA, this ambiguity would disappear. But here they have the same types and yet um, they have the same symbolic notation because the interfaces are, are the same in terms of those types. Um, Hmm. So I probably should have added an additional slide showing the relationship of this to PRISM. So um, what you see on here from the lecture is, uh, is both a particular case for the diagram discussed here, um, illustrating its kind of data flow relationships what draws data from whom, or who draws data from whom. Um, so, uh, you know, why, uh, why out here is drawing data from X2 out, um, which is, is shown, uh, shown here. So Y out is this guy, it's labeled Y, the entire thing. And it's drawing data from X2 out. Um, and so there's an arrow from Y out to X2 out, even though it's X2 provides data to Y2 out. Um, this is showing what Y2 out depends on. Uh, I apologize for the English, on what it depends. Um, and, um, uh, and, you know, similar arrows say from Y1 in um, for B and Y1 in. Um, or sorry, X, X1 in says draw zero from X2 out. So here's X1 in B draws its data from X2 out B. Um, so we have this data flow relationship. This one draws data from there. Um, and he drew this in a way where these ones enter the space. These are the ones that kind of come into the um, into the space um, out of things. Um, they include outputs from inner ones and inputs for the entire thing. Um, the input to the entire thing, which in this case is it's kind of um, uh, nothing, uh, no particular value associated with the Minota unit. Um, these ones are leaving the space. They're kind of going into the subsystems or they're coming out of it. So this is very specific to this system here. And um, we can read off, it turns out the mappings from a diagram like this, kind of a data flow diagram. So we can kind of read out um, the two sides of this. Oh, sorry. Oh man, I'm, I'm having trouble with the arrow keys this morning. Okay, um, we can read out the two elements of the poly poly map, the lens map. Um, here we have ACB maps to B on this side, um, and we have ACB times this is the singleton one. Um, maps over to the exponents on the left, which are ABA. This is just tensoring these two, which multiplies the coefficients and multiplies the, the exponents. So this, it turns out, is can be read out here of, of this diagram. And so this one here, we have ACB mapping to B. Um, and here we have ACB um, mapping to uh, ABA. You notice again, the arrows are the reverse direction of these arrows, um, but they, they capture these sort of relationships between um, the system as a whole here and these, uh, these subsystems. Um, and 
uh, and from this, you can kind of read out um, this relationship as a whole from the system between the system as a whole and these subsystems. So these are two different ways of expressing this and you can derive from this, you can derive that. But what's not so obvious from this, um, uh, from this diagram, is this is very particular to this example, but this case here on the left is quite general. And um, this diagram is just kind of an illustration of this. So what this is saying is like the X out um, port, the thing from, from X out needs to bind to or, or be specified to um, one of the outputs from the internal, um, the in, internal subsystems in general. Um, it needs to come from one of the internal subsystems. So if you had more than one subsystem, um, they would all be listed out here. This is not particular uh, to this diagram where X out takes it from X2 out in particular. It's saying it has to come from one of these. So the outputs for the outer system have to come from the outputs from the inner system. And the inputs for the inner system have to come from the outputs of the inner system, um, such as via feedback or being fed from an earlier one. Uh, or from the inputs to the outer system, the inputs to the outer system. And so these are very general relationships and it's binding this set to one of, or binding this kind of, um, uh, this particular port to an element of this set of possibilities. This is like a co-product in set. Um, we're, we're, we're mapping this to one particular one of them. Um, and this shows you which it is for this diagram. Um, and uh, it turns out that this um, has this direct mapping to prisms. Um, you may recall with prisms, uh, we had sort of an unpacking um, of a possibility into a set of possibilities. So a real number was either just some arbitrary real or as an integer, uh, for example, or to you to draw an example from Jeremy Gibbons, you know, a shape is either a square or a circle um, or some uh, some other sort of shapeoid thing. Um, and and with a prism, we have this set of possibilities being sort of laid out for us, um, uh, and that's dual to a lens where we have. You know, pairs of things being given. Here we have co-products of things being given or called co-pairs sometimes. You're adding the possibilities together, either this or this or this, whereas with lenses, we're giving both the state and the new, the new value to get a new state, for example. Um, so this um, is a prism structure and it can be formally represented as a prism. Um, uh, I, I should have uh, pulled together a slide on this. It kind of shows how this relationship of wiring diagrams to these interfaces has this characteristic of a prism. It's, it's rather pleasing and it's kind of dual to this lens idea um, that, that we're dealing with. Okay, so there are two big examples featured uh, within this lecture that were a little bit more uh, textured, and I'm going to talk about um, talk about these. So um, the first was Fibonacci, and uh, with Fibonacci there were two subsystems. We had an entire system, uh, which the outer system, which had a numeric output. Um, it had a natural number. Uh, and these two subsystems uh, were defined. The outer one had no had no input. Um, there were there were no inputs to it. So representing that as a map between polynomials, you get something like this. Um, so the inner system, you, you have these two subsystems, 
Uh, and one of them is this plus and one is a delay. And the idea crudely is, you know, you, you go through and you're kind of iterating through in a state, stateful sort of way. Um, uh, you, you have a sum of two things that yields a product and uh, you want to basically feedback, um, feedback, excuse me, a product, the, the sum, and you want to feed that back essentially for the next round. Um, one of those things is the next round for the basis and the other one is the current sort of last one. I'm not expressing that well, but uh, if you have one, one, um, you, you'll, you'll then add them and to have one, one, two, and you'll save sort of, uh, uh, you'll, you'll be dealing here with um, the, uh, the one being uh, added uh, kept in the wings. Um, so the, so this one, uh, you have this one, two uh, here, and then the next round, you'll be actually adding this one, two, and you'll get two, three, and the next round, you'll get two, three, and you'll get three, five, uh, et cetera. So there's some component of this. The, the two is conserved for the next round. The three is conserved for the next round. The five would be conserved for the next round. Um, whereas uh, this sum is, is uh, placed into here in the next round. Um, this sum is placed into here in the next round. And really that's what's going on here. Um, so we have a plus and we have a and b. And uh, the fact that we have sort of two going from the second position as the output um, uh, to the, um, to this position here is, uh, uh, excuse me, I, I didn't quite phrase that right, but this, this two going, going over to here uh, reflects the fact that we're reusing one of the, um, uh, the components from last time and, and then we're using the sum as the second one. So here's the sum being circled around for the second component. And here's the delay, uh, um, uh, the delay from earlier um, uh, that's, that's being placed for the other component. Uh, that would be, for example, this two um, or this three here. Uh, earlier, um, this three was the sum, but now it's, it's here and it's being shifted over to be the second of the uh, of the things that's added uh, at this stage. Okay, so um, how, would, how does all, all this work more symbolically? Well, uh, we have two subsystems um, and these two subsystems tensor together to map to the outer interface. What we're drawing on is exactly uh, this sort of idea. Um, uh, or, or this idea. So we have the state of these internal subsystems here and uh, we're intentioning them together and mapping to the, to the outer system. So here we go. Um, we're, we're tensoring these together and mapping to the outer systems. Um, and uh, this, so actually these are the, the interfaces from the early system, I should say. Um, it's, it's actually not the, just the state, it's the interfaces to it. So the wiring diagram is wiring up the interfaces, the inner systems, the interface to the outer systems. And uh, here, um, this consists of some maps. So the maps are basically shown here for the relationship of the interface to the internal systems, um, to the subsystems, to the outer system. This can be a map there. And then each of these boxes, these internal systems is a state, is a um, dynamical system itself that can be mapped out. And really that's the two steps that are done here and here. So um, in this case, we have a simple mapping. Uh, we have two components of the mapping. They're shown, shown here uh, rather, 
um, rather tersely, uh, but the idea is that uh, if we have this component here in multiplying these things through, um, you'll, you'll see that essentially you have a, uh, a sum here, which has a certain output and a delayed value here, sort of tagged with that, with, uh, with a certain value. Uh, and this reflects the fact that when we actually tensor them, these two things multiply, uh, the coefficients multiply. So it's like a pair of those tagged values. And that maps to positions. So that has to map to a value for the whole fib, which is a particular number. And it's just taking the delayed value here um, as, as that number for the entirety, uh, the outer system. But then we need a mapping of the exponents. And the mapping of the exponents is going to go from the positions here, uh, which are going to be uh, associated with uh, the, these, which, and those are gonna map to a, uh, a mapping from this, this is kind of in a curried form, from this guy to the exponents, uh, which, and the exponents here are um, something for A, uh, and, and uh, or B, uh, and uh, to Dell here. Um, so it's going to, to map over uh, from this guy here uh, into these exponents. Uh, and these exponents also multiply. Um, so we have uh, N, N to the AB as the exponent here. We have N to the two Dell here. And when we multiply the exponents, uh, we were going to get the multiplication uh, of these two exponentiations here in the, um, in this. But really, it's better to think about this. I, I found this a little bit confusing the ex, uh, when this is an exponent. Really what this is, is a map from A to N. This is a map from B to N. This is just a set, and it's just giving a name to the set. So you can think of it as a two, N squared, where it's just giving a name to each component. And N squared is just like uh, N times N. And here we have like N to the one. And so we have N squared here, N to the one here. We multiply those together, we get something that's N cubed. We, we need to be able to have a value for A that maps to N, B that maps to N, and two del that maps to N. And that's what's shown here. Um, so writing it with these tag notation can be helpful but it, it can also be a little bit confusing, I think. Um, and uh, here we just have these, uh, these maps. So this is really N squared. This is N to the one and multiplying together gives N cubed. Uh, we have a value for each of these ones here, A, a B, and two del. Um, and uh, the two delay uh, here uh, is just taking uh, the value that's currently output by the sum, that's what this is, and uh, A is taking a value uh, that is uh, also output by the sum, um, that's why this is looped around, and B is taking the value that's currently output from delayed, um, which happens to be the value output from the whole system as well. So now we substitute it in. This is the mapping of interfaces, the inner systems, the interfaces, the outer systems. For each of these boxes, there's a dynamical system. Um, and uh, the whole of the system, um, just as we did here, um, the entirety, the entire system is the product of this left side of these dynamical systems lens maps for the subsystem and the product of, of, of this thing on the right, this interface for the entire system. And that's what you kind of see here. This is a mapping for the entire system. But um, each of these subsystems is itself a dynamical system that can be defined in terms of its behavior. So if we consider this one, we have some internal state N, 
um, uh, this is natural numbers, and it maps to the, the interface. That's the one that's here. It maps, uh, this one has a similar form, but it maps to this interface um, here. And uh, what is this mapping? Well, um, uh, it's mapping from positions to positions. Um, and, uh, and that's mapping kind of the current, current state of it, um, the value n um, to, to where the sum is n. Uh, great. But it also has to map from um, contextualized by this, uh, it has to map to take uh, a mapping from n squared where one of the values is a, one is b, over to n. And so all it does is add a and b up. We're not even using this current state. We're just using um, the, uh, the values, uh, essentially, that are in this, uh, uh, in this n squared. Uh, and for this guy, all we do is we delay it. Um, so. Uh, so we map positions in the same sort of way. Um, and we map to del, um, uh, if we have a value here for n to the one or n, uh, essentially uh, we, we take that value n prime, um, that's the input. And uh, we, 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 Take that, take that in, and use it as our as our value. So, uh, this the state update for this guy basically updates the state with what the current value is, and then we have that state. And the output from this guy, remember the positions are the output. The output from this guy is the delayed value from last time. It's the current state. So this one, the plus, was really didn't have state in any any terribly meaningful way. Um, kind of was the was the sum, uh, but it's um, uh, it's it's dealing with this being um, the uh, you know we 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 have the state the sum being being the the uh, the current state. Here with delayed, uh, we actually have a more subtle thing going on. So there's like, this is the current input to two delay. And that becomes the state of the system. This is the state output here. It's the one that maps from the exponents contextualized by the coefficients on the left back to the exponents to update the state. This is the value as it was last time. Um, uh, oh, excuse me, as it is right now, becomes the state. And the output of this system is actually the, the state uh, which of the system. So the state each time is overridden by this two del input. And yet that state now is used to determine the output. So there's this constant replacing of the state of the system by this two del and it's always presenting the last state. Um, that's, that's what this is, the last state, the previous state of it. So here, there's essentially a delaying going on, which is exactly what you want, which allows the output from the previous time to then be used as the input uh, for this time. And there's this successive delay rather than feeding it through immediately. So um, this delay mechanism is, uh, is overriding the state constantly, but the current state is used to determine the output. So, so it's always one step behind. Uh, now, the case of Turing machines is a little bit more uh, subtle uh, here, but hopefully with this example, um, in some ways, I think it's actually a little bit easier. So last time we talked about how from, from the lecture three, uh, we spoke about processors uh, in tapes and there were kind of two models given. 
for processors and tapes. So one is um, had no no halting, and we just had a processor who outputted movement and and sort of uh, one for processing um, the character that it's um, that it wants to write, and uh, and it took. Uh, an alphabetic character that it read. Okay, so that's that's what this one was, putting aside halting. And then the tape was a dynamical system that output the current character that it's at which the head is located, but it took as input a command to move uh, and to write something. Um, and there was a certain logic to it that we went through. There was a little bit more um, tricky to think about because the tape was itself a mapping, a mapping from the integers to the um, to the alphabetic characters. Because for any position on the tape, that's the integer, we get a character. Okay, then last time again there was this layering in of halting. And now the processor could be in one of two modes. One could be in a mode where again, it, it outputs movement and, and, and a character to write and takes as input a character. The other could be in a halt state where it output halt and um, it took as input just something I said next, basically. Um, and, and then the tape could be either in a state where it, um, uh, it accepted as before uh, movement and things to write uh, and output the current character, but now it could get a halt instruction. And when it gets a halt instruction, the idea was it went into a state and this T is actually times Y to the zero. And what that means is the state won't be updated anymore. There's like, it's in a fixed state. It's, um, there's no more next even going on. It's just for all time, it is this tape going forward, a fixed tape. Um, so this is its mode for, for halt. But what's a little bit, curious about it is we didn't really have them coupled last time. There were there were each subsystems, each interesting, but there was no way for the processor to tell the, the tape, hey, go into the halt state. Um, and, uh, and that was kind of a shortcoming. So that's what was filled in this time by David Spivak. Um, so, uh, so you'll recall that dynamical systems in general can be expressed as this. And when we have internal subsystems, uh, we, we, we tensor together the subsystems. So here are the subsystems um, uh, that we have are, are this one for the, uh, for the processor and this one for the tape. We, we, we just saw them. Those are exactly the ones here. I've just copied it down. And these each have these interfaces. Um, and and then we're going to have an overall interface for the Turing machine. And we're going to tensor these interfaces and map it to the overall interfaces for the Turing machine. And the overall in interface for the Turing machine, although there's not really discussion of it, um, uh, is of, of this form. One is the tape is in this unchanging state going forward. And I think the Y state, this is the mode for the entire system where it's just being told next, 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 essentially. Um, so it is a single input and kind of a, a single output. So really the output from the Turing machine that's really interesting will be the tape that's generated at the end of the computation. That's kind of the idea. So we have these interfaces for the internal systems and we're gonna map them in an interface for the outer system. The idea here is, is, is basically the same one as we had here. We had these interfaces, this external system, and we mapped them to the, interfa to the interface for the, for the outer systems, or uh, similar to what we had here, um, mapping interfaces. So here, our interfaces are of this sort. Um, 
we have this one and this one, and we have to tensor them together because they're running concurrently and internally. Okay, now here's the really nice thing. You know, there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on, but big picture, I don't want to lose track of the fact that, that what's going on is that we're kind of modularly building up the specification for the whole from specification for these parts. So going from this to this, we just kind of layered in in a lightweight way the, these extra modes by co-product. Quite, quite sweet there. And now we're gonna be combining them with this tensor. And symbolically, what's gonna happen is that we can expand this because each of these has this structure. We can expand this into a sum of, of the following. And this is provably the same as this. And we can reason about each of these combinations. Why? Because we're representing this as this kind of sum up. So rather than deal with just black boxes that are monolithic and we can't, we can't understand, the fact that we can represent this symbolically in this kind of crisp way modularly lets us then express something for the whole and then reason about that. And the reasoning for the Turing machine was of this form. And it was, it was done very tersely and I wanted to unpack it a little bit, um, recognizing that we're in our last five minutes here. So the idea here is that each of these terms that came from this was mapped to the output for the entire system. So the entire system is of this form. So we're gonna map this first, first one, this one, into the outer system. Um, and really we're gonna map it to Y because if we have Y, we can inject it into Y plus T. It's just, this is a co-product. It's a choice of either a Y or T. We have a Y, so we'll have a Y, fine. Um, and, um, and then we'll have to deal with, uh, with each of these others. Well, it turns out each of these is, is, is rather nice. Um, there's three of them that are easy and then the, the, the fourth. So this one turns out to be impossible. This, the, just the logic of how the, uh, the machinery works, it turns out you can't get into a, the way it's logically designed, you cannot get into a state where the tape is showing the fixed unchanging state while the processor is still outputting movements and taking inputs. So the second one is by design sort of ruled out by the logic shown with arrows here as to how to update things, how the halt mechanism works. And, where, where the system starts. So we actually don't need to specify the input for this because it, it doesn't, it, it's not something which, um, which could happen. Um, there's these three and four actually are kind of the halting components. Um, and this is kind of straightforward. If the processor says halt, um, then we need to map. So we have a map here. We need a map from this guy to Y. Oh man, how are we gonna do that? Okay, we have a map from this guy to Y. So we, first of all, we can kind of unpack this guy. And once again, we're taking advantage of the fact these are symbolic and we can multiply them by each other. The fact that we were representing these things in this way with polynomials lets us do these simplifications and reasoning and transformation. So we multiply these things by, cool. So we multiply these things and you know the coefficients multiply and the, the exponents multiply with tensor and, uh, and, and this, ten pro, uh, co, this uh, exponent is one and and so we get something like this if, if you tensor these. And we have to map that to Y. Okay, so we have a map of positions. And what is that gonna do? Well, it's just, it's a trivial map. It just maps halt A for any A, it maps it to one. Okay, it's 
Only one choice. We don't have any other choice. Okay. Um, oh, it gives one, no matter what its value is, fine. The backwards map is more interesting. So backwards map is for any uh, halt in A, which is really any choice of A, combined with a kind of one here. This is kind of like a singleton. Um, really for any A conceptually, uh, this is the only one that is real information. We, we need to map to A plus M plus halt, but, but this A is in the context of a halt. So we're gonna map it to the halt state here, um, to, to the halt state. And that's gonna essentially tell the, uh, tell the tape, hey, you got a halt. Um, it take, it, giving it as the input to the tape. And so it relays a halt command essentially output by the processor to be input mm, by, the, by the tape. Um, and four really completes that. Here, um, if the processor uh, is, is in this uh, halt state um, and, the, um, and the tape, uh, okay, so right, uh, let me make sure uh, I've got that right. Akash, I had a labeled version of this is around and unfortunately I've missed it. But uh, here um, we've essentially gone into this uh, halt state and that's right. And uh, this halt state for the tape will put the, uh, the occurrence of this halt state for the tape uh, as input, will put it into this T state where it essentially enters enters this uh, state of unchanging tape. And that's part of the logical mechanism that we derived last time um, uh, for, for halting. So if it gets a halt, then it goes to this fixed T state where it just stays frozen for perpetuity. Um, so that was part of the internal logic associated with the, the tape mechanism. So the only one that's a little bit textured, and, and I, I don't, um, I'm not gonna be able to, to expand on this quite as much as I'd like, but basically it's this one. And um, we have to figure out how to map it to Y, because once we get a Y, we have a Y plus T. So basically we again take advantage of the symbolic structure. The fact that we have this written symbolically means we can combine it in a nice algebraic way. And so the coefficients multiply. Um, I'm kind of putting things in bold to indicate their coefficients. And the exponents multiply. Um, OK. Um, and, uh, and so we have this mapping. And this mapping has a forward map that's trivial, just maps to 1 because there's only one position here, uh, okay. Um, not, not, nothing, nothing to specify there. Um, uh, and then the backwards map goes for each one of these. And for one, that's the singleton, we have to map back to this guy. And it's a, it may look fearsome, but it's a pretty sort of, um, simple mapping, so, and it's actually shown by David's notation here. So this A here uh, basically gets mapped to this A. That's why I put them in the same color. The character currently read by the processor um, uh, or from the, the tape is given as, as uh, you know, mumble, uh, yeah, yeah. The, process, the, the character currently read from the tape, output by the tape, is given as input to the processor. That's why this is this A is not in the exponent. That's why it's not in bold. Um, so it's, it came from the exponent from there. And it's given as essentially input to the, uh, to the processor. That's its input. The output from the tape is the input for the processor. That's what we're capturing here. We couldn't capture last time because we had decoupled systems. And then 
A plus M, the output from the processor saying move or saying write, that becomes the input to the tape. Um, and it leads to movement and writing on the tape um, without the halt needing to be worried about here. So, um, so before, last time, there was this logic within each subsystem. And now what we're getting is the logic between these systems um, as they relate to sort of uh, this overall system. And, and that logic uh, between these systems is letting the tape, you know, give the thing it's, re it's reading out into as input to the processor and the things the processor is putting out as input uh, into the tape's commands to move or to write things. Um, those were the missing links. But, you know, one of the biggest pictures here is again, goes back to this foundational issue. This is a representation that may look Byzantine, it may look Baroque, it may look like it's, you know, a lot of weird rules with mapping forward and mapping backward. But at the end of the day, it's a modular way to specify these systems that's transformable. It has this declaratively visual, visual this declarative visual representation and wiring diagrams, which is cool uh, for simpler uh, systems. Uh, it's composable. Um, it's elegant, uh, but it's modular. And it's modular in the sense that we layer in these, uh, these components. We layer in modes of the system uh, from going from reason about one mode to reason about multiple modes. It's modular in the sense that we can then take those modes and tensor them together. And it's modular in the sense that we can multiply systems and get systems that that output both things but take a choice of inputs we can add them together as modes and we can tensor them to keep them concurrently and get a mapping for the whole system um, and so that transformability gives us this amazing um, uh, amazing ability to kind of um, reason about the behavior for the entire system and specify it in a crisp way that otherwise might get very tangled up in, in layers of hierarchy. It allows us to kind of break it down into pieces that are well suited to our characterization of the system, such as in these, these modes here. Um, and what we're going to see about, start to see in the next, next time, and I, I may ask you watch two lectures, bearing in mind that there'll be probably a lot of features will go over your heads, but they'll lead to a certain continuity um, and finality to sort of the summary is they'll support this analytic reasoning. So all of this will support this amazingly rich capacity to reason about the behaviors of the system and how those behaviors change as we combine subsystems in these successive ways and will allow us to reason about the mappings between the state spaces of systems using these things called shards. So that lecture, those two lectures will take you to the kind of uh, give you a glimpse of, of where this stuff can go. And it is admittedly at, at sort of the limits of my full appreciation, but uh, uh, I, I see tremendous elegance and kind of uh, power of analytic reasoning coming out of it. So I think I will ask you to look at two lectures. And the first of them is this one on day 4.5, double category of arenas. Um, and then we'll see uh, uh, 6.5 after that. Jenna, yes. Um, so I'm just looking at the schedule for next week and I'm realizing that I don't have any classes scheduled for this one and i'm looking at your calendar too and i'm not sure where they are so i'm just <laughs> checking on when next lecture good might call. be a uh, good call it's <laughs> it, the intention was because last like monday is the last day of classes um yeah and uh so 
this should be in uh, 10 o'clock on Monday. And uh, if it's not in 10 o'clock on Monday, there's been a boo-boo from somewhere. Um, so um, uh, yeah, you're right. Um, well, uh, we're gonna have to fix that. Um, uh, well, if you look at my schedule, look at that, look at that. There's, there's actually a calendar appointment for CMPT 898 there now. Um, so um, I, I just inserted it uh, assertively, but I, I actually have to talk about this with Christine. Um, there's a negotiation which has to take place and I'll have to check with all of your schedules. I mean, in all seriousness, I, I know you folks might have conflicts. My full intention was to show up here at 10 a.m on Monday, but I do think there was an oversight uh, made and I'm not sure where it came in because it is a last day of fall classes there. So I will check with Christine to ensure that uh, Friday, uh, that on Monday we can talk at 10 a.m. And if we can't, um, we'll have to, you know, schedule it in another, another slot Monday or Tuesday. And I see, um, uh, you know, I see some potential for putting it at 9 a.m. or 5 p.m. or what have you. But um, uh, but if it needed to even go in the faculty meeting, uh, I could probably get away with that since it's a class uh, that overrides uh, faculty meetings. So um, uh, so yeah, I'll well, thank you for spotting that. Thanks very much. Um, maybe you could mention it to Christine. Um, and get her thinking, well, okay, wait a minute. I think you and I are meeting now, so you're not gonna be free any, well, maybe you will be free. If you if you mentioned it to Christine, I'd, I'd, or could anyone else could mention it to Christine, I'd appreciate it. And maybe we'll get her working on this, okay? Sounds good. Okay, yep, uh, that's all for uh, today. I think, um, Maybe what we'll do is Monday, we'll start with questions, including the exercises for today. And uh, I recognize there's a lot of stuff in the lectures from David Jazz Myers, the two lectures, which, which will go over your heads. Um, and so uh, I don't feel quite as impelled to try to unpack, unpack things systematically. So why don't we use it to ask more basic questions that you have and, um, you know, I, as, as time allows, I may sketch out some high level implications, but um, won't have any sort of thorough coverage. So try again to bring any questions um, and, and comments and so on to Monday's, uh, to Monday's lecture, whenever it may be. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, take care there.